in the Bible are iconic and familiar to us. The word good is used after almost each act of God's creation, from Genesis 1-3, the creation of life, to the creation of the human being on the sixth day. It concludes with the assertion that everything was indeed very good. It is the little and widely used word, Hebrew word tob, which is of fundamental significance for the theme of our talk. And indeed for aesthetics as a whole. In fact, tob does not only translate is good, and we were already hearing that yesterday, it also connotes beautiful, excellent, something agreeable and pleasant to the senses, something well made for its purpose. So this word is so centrally important for our theme as here from the very beginning of the Bible, from creation, as well as in philosophical theological reflection on beauty since Plato to this day, goodness and beauty have always been perceived as closely linked closely intertwined. The early Christians perceived manifestations of beauty, truth, goodness, and unity in the world as signs of the revelation of God's perfect, immeasurable, divine beauty, truth, goodness, and unity. Beauty was seen as objective, as intelligible, and always having to do with spiritual and moral purification. Beauty is something that attracts and can instill love. Augustine emphasized in platonic fashion how beauty includes symmetry, proportion, light, and order. Beauty hence relates to the cosmos. The individual parts of the cosmos are beautiful and make up its total beauty. Pseudo-Dionysus, in his work, The Divine Names, had the most developed aesthetics on beauty in early Christian times. Influenced by Neoplatonism and also by Gnosticism, his apophatic mystical theology develops the symbolism of light, whereby the supreme light is the good itself, that radiates in every mind. So beauty is the source of everything that is beautiful and it unites everything. In turn, all creatures must yearn for God who is perfect beauty and goodness. Um, Pseudo Dionysus um, achieved a certain synthesis in his ideas on beauty as he integrated Neoplatonist, Biblical, and Patristic thought. Now, the Orthodox theologian David Bentley Hart um, points out, again with reference to Hans Urs von Balthasar, and I'm not a Balthasarian either, who is Paul Oeuvre was perceived in terms of a theological aesthetic, how beauty always has the power to cross boundaries between the transcendent and the immanent, the ideal and the real, the natural and the supernatural. Echoing the early church fathers, he notes how beauty evokes desire and is known through desire. Thus he asserts that the Trinitarian love of God and the love that God asks of us is eros and agape at once. A desire for the other that delights in the distance of otherness. That is, which values the goodness and being of the other. So, paradise then, the garden of Eden, God's creation, was not just perceived as being good, but also as beautiful. And we often forget that. It was well designed. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was attractive. 
And it was good and beautiful to, to God, God's self, when God looked upon it with delight on the sixth day. Paradise, um, originally a Persian word, connotes park or enclosure. Paradise became associated with the Garden of Eden. It is and always has been perceived as a place where suffering and evil do not exist, where all is well, harmonious, fertile, beautiful, good, and filled with life. The word paradise occurs more frequently in the Hebrew Bible than in the New Testament. The New Testament writers lifted the notion of paradise from a perfect place, an earthly wonderful garden, into the heavenly sphere. In Luke 23, 43, Jesus on the cross tells the penitent thief that they would be together in paradise on that day. Moreover, Jesus conveyed that in his ministry, the eschatological paradise as described in Isaiah 35, 5, was made manifest. So in the New Testament, the idea arises that paradise was fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus. While the notion of paradise spans both creation, theological, and eschatological notions, the kingdom of God has been conceived as even more future-oriented more eschatological. This kingdom relates to our eternal life in God after death, where we will be embraced by God's all-pervading love and peace. Yet, significantly from the Gospels, we know that God's kingdom <clears throat> is something that Christians are invited and ought to live and strive for already in the here and now on earth by emulating Jesus, by living according, according to what he taught and modeled about the kingdom in his parables, in his ministry, in his radical witness of faith and relationship with God. Kingdom of God occurs far more frequently in the Bible than the word paradise. Essentially, this kingdom confounds all human and material notions of kingdom, such as worldly power, pomp, might, hierarchy, military strength, and elitism. So, it replaces these two, Jesus' kingships, kingship, his teachings, his life, redemptory death and resurrection. Indeed, we are told in the Gospels that God's kingdom can only be perceived through the innocence of a child and that a wealthy person will find it extremely difficult to get into that kingdom. The kingdom of God is the reign of love, goodness, truth, justice and peace. So wherever these attributes are realized, we do get glimpses of the ultimate radiant beauty of the kingdom of heaven. Glimpses of paradise. I want to now look at some concrete examples of where we find glimpses of the beauty of paradise in our world and experience. Naturally, we know that paradise, a perfect place, has never existed here on earth. Our earth was not made in seven days, it evolved through evolution. Yet, the notion of paradise is deeply rooted in the human being. It's a kind of archetype. It's the longing for a beautiful place where all is at peace. And that certainly is being brought home to us these days. 
While this longing will only find complete fulfillment in the eschaton, we do get glad glimpses of paradise in our common experiences of life. Now, one of the most widely available experiences of beauty, occasional moments where we feel as if in paradise, are walks in nature. It's hard to get here. Humans are aware of the necessity that for our mental, spiritual, and physical well-being, it is essential to spend time in nature, to walk in forests, in fields, along the sea, in local parks, the restorative, healing, and inspiring dimension of nature are praised by poets, painted by painters, and recommended by healthcare professionals. In fact, we know how refreshed and relaxed we are after a walk in nature. Certainly, we may not feel on every walk that we are in paradise, <laughs> but on a calm, blue sky, sunny day, when we are surrounded by beautiful, even breathtaking scenery, it is not uncommon to suddenly exclaim, what a beautiful day, paradise. And such an exclamation is not premeditated, not a planned statement or thought out observation. It is an instant, a reaction, a feeling. It springs from a moment of a sense of happiness of peace, joy, wonder, goodness, beauty, when we experience life as if we were in paradise. And what is interesting is the fact that the fellow person we walk with, a fellow walker, to whom we say that, will almost always and at once agree. And in a way, that means that actually humans have a very similar notion of what we consider paradisiacal, beautiful, and good. And it coheres very much with God's delight at God's creation as described in Genesis 1.31. The sense of paradise comes even more to the fore in our hopes and expectations of holidays. We only need to look at the thousands of ads for holidays in the sun, so-called dream holidays in tropical paradise. And the word here conjures up all that people long for. A wonderful blue sea, white beaches, fantastic food, total relaxation, spending a joyful time with family, with friends or lovers, among the birds and plants, mountains and sea. And even if it is not a beach holiday, but a cultural trip to a famous city, the one thing in common in all holidays is the longing to see and experience beauty. Beauty through light-filled sunny weather, beauty in nature and in culture, Beauty that opens up new ideas, new vistas, new possibilities, taking us out of everyday life into a sphere of heightened imagination, wonder, excitement, and transcendence. Another, far more specific and particular manifestation of the longing for paradise were the artist colonies that emerged at the end of the 19th and early 20th century in Europe. The Impressionists and Post-Impressionist artists and their followers had already begun to paint straight on the canvas en plein air. Artists like Van Gogh, Cézanne, Matisse, et al. discovered the intense light in the south of France and the Mediterranean. At this time, too, artist colonies sprung up in, more, in the more Nordic parts 
including famously the village of Pont d'Avon in Brittany, the village of Obswede in North Germany, it's very near the uh, North Sea, and the small town of Zakopane in the Polish Tatra Mountains. So what the artist who joined these colonies essentially shared was the desire to get away from the big cities with their growing industrialization. And these artists really wanted to return to a more simple life in peace, in harmony, inspired by nature and by the customs, culture, and sometimes the um, rel religiosity of the peasant people. So the artist longed, as it were, for the beauty of unspoiled nature that would stimulate their creativity. Yet, of course, and that's also important, they belonged to a social cultural elite. They were blow-ins in these rural parts, educated and usually from a middle-class background, a more urban background, and often, however, living in rather precarious financial circumstances. Paula Modersohn Becker, 1876 to 1907, the most eminent of the Worpswede artists, evoked something of that notion of paradise. When in her diary she called Worpswede, with its birches, pines, canals, little sailing boats and bogs, ein Wunderland, ein Götterland, a wonderland, a land of the gods. Paul Gauguin, who founded the colony in Pont d'Avon, in the end went even much further and painted his great works in Tahiti in the South Seas, an island and, of course, a French colony where he imagined and imaged the native population as living in complete harmony with nature. The artists in Zakopane, influenced by European artistic avant-garde movements, were involved in trying to find a modern artistic style for Poland. Now, the leading names include, I hope I pronounce this kind of okay, was Stanisław Witkiewicz, who developed the Zakopane style, and his son Stanisław Ignacy Witkiewicz, as well as a host of other artists, um, people who were into dance, into theater, and music. Now, in the end, the artist colonies often did not survive. Even though to this day the locations do still inspire artists and those interested in the arts. Human weaknesses, like jealousies, animosities, and different convictions would lead to fallouts. So, the realization of an artistic paradise proved not eternal, but very much a limited, a human hope, a brilliant aspiration, yet an imperfect reality <clears throat> in time and space. So, now I want to look at glimpses of the kingdom. Um, yeah, signs of the beauty of the kingdom of God. While it probably is true to say that the notion of paradise generally relates more to perception of nature, the kingdom of God as anticipated in the here and now evokes not only a place of beauty, but more specifically, the centrality of, the benefi of beneficial human action, of good relationships, and the readiness to suffer for what is right, as described in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, in his parable stories, and in the book of Acts, where we are told that 
the Earl of Christians held all things in common. And of course, it does not stop there. The personification and most poignant reminder of the kingdom is, of course, Jesus himself, the God incarnate, his life and self-giving on the cross for our redemption, his resurrection and his promise of eternal life. And it is indeed his ultimate sacrifice, his total embodiment of love, a love that could not be greater, that give us pointers as to where we find glimpses of the beauty of the divine kingdom in our world. In other words, all manifestations of genuine love, truth, goodness, and peace. And in a world which we often experience as harsh, despairing, cruel, full of war, evil, in injustice, exploitation of people, a world of illness, of pandemics and depression, anxiety, one might be quite slow to acknowledge that actually all around us, there are countless instances where we find the beauty of the kingdom made manifest in smaller and sometimes also in bigger ways. One of the greatest examples here are prophets and martyrs, political protesters and activists. In other words, people who are ready to suffer, uh, who are uh, willing to commit and sometimes even willing to live give their lives because they work for a triumph over evil, goodness over evil. Christian martyrs persecuted for their faith in the early church. And today, people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Edith Stein, Nelson Mandela, Marriott Tuchman, um, Harriet Tuchman, and the countless unnamed, countless unnamed heroes who pay with their lives or health for their convictions and their faith. And indeed, the abolishment of slavery, the end of wars, the overthrowing of dictators, and the termination of injustices of any kind intimate to us something of the beauty of the kingdom to come, already anticipated here. Um, one might not immediately think of NGOs or aid organizations in the context of thinking about the kingdom of God. Yet they must be included here as all of these bodies originate from a human sense of righteousness and of responsibility and care. They share the aspiration to make the world a better, a more peaceful, just and kind place. Even if those who set up such institutions may do so primarily for humanitarian and social reasons, rather than from religious motivation, a religious motivation of the Christian vision of the kingdom of God, of goodness, truthfulness, and beauty, that is quite visible in such commitment which goes hand in hand with more faith-motivated action. Moreover, in recent years, and again in the last few months, we have become intensely aware, once again, that the desire to do what is right and good is something innate in the human being. In the face of a most horrendous war in Ukraine and people fleeing their country, thousands of people rush to help in whatever ways they can and could. While a minority of people reject and maltreat refugees, we certainly saw that in Germany with the AFD party and worse, uh, even worse, infinitely more uh, do what is necessary and give help. 
And we already saw it with the refugees coming in some years ago from the Near East. It is abundantly clear that in the midst of the ugliness of war and destruction, the solidarity and beauty of huge numbers of people who freely give of their time, money and home to assist people in dire need has been tremendous. That Jesus himself started life as a refugee should not be forgotten in this context. To conclude, the modern French writer Jean Anouy claimed that it is above all in the encounter of beauty that one does not doubt the existence of God. Pope Francis echoes these sentiments um, when he says, all that is good, all that is true, all that is beautiful brings us to God. From what I have argued, it has become clear that manifestations uh, of beauty in our world will always remind us of both. The longing for the lost paradise and for the kingdom to come. Certain instances of beauty may evoke in us more of the former and others more of the latter. We encounter beauty as the realization and shining force of goodness, truth, justice, and peace. Yet sadly, we are also aware that wherever these attributes are turned into their opposites, namely hate, lies, injustice, violence, and war, the antithesis of beauty becomes apparent. Ugliness of evil and chaos. Creativity and constructive imagination, the wonder of nature as well as of artistic expression, offer moments of beauty revealed. So when we open our eyes, our ears and mouths, our sense of touch, our hearts and minds and souls, we experience and become aware of beauty, not only as something exceptional, rare, or overwhelming, but in the everyday life all around us. Indeed, we encounter what the book of Genesis describes as Tob, beauty and goodness, in every genuine embrace and kiss, in loyal friendship and in love. We see beauty and goodness in millions of young people wanting to save our planet, as well as in millions of those who dedicate themselves for the work of justice and peace. Poignantly and significantly, we also encounter the transcendent healing power of beauty in the midst of evil and war, illness, abuse and suffering. When victims and survivors plant seeds, we hear seeds like there, seeds in their heads, flowers and trees, and when artists and creative people create music and paintings, literature, films, documentaries, in defiance, really in defiance, against all evil and ugliness. And in that way, all the arts can play their role in offering not only joy and comfort, but also social critique, protest, and prophecy. Goodness and beauty in the face of evil make transparent that essentially the kingdom of God is found wherever people take to heart God's commandment of loving one's neighbor as oneself. The unique power of the imagination and the deeply embedded desire and capacity to create beauty in the human being is expressed in myriad abundance. From a children's song to the great symphonies, from a small garden to the great parks, 
in the world. From a well-made ceramic plate to the marvelous sculptures by Michelangelo. And all of this strikes a chord with Dostoevsky's iconic words that we already heard, that beauty will save the world. No doubt, time and again, in the past as in the here and now, beauty's radiance has reminded humans of the lost paradise and of the heavenly kingdom to come. Thank you. indeed, Geza. Um, now we'll move on to our second uh, contribution this morning, and that is Ina, also a friend we've known for a long time. An old so, friend. An old friend. As well. <laughs> <laughs> Not as old as us, of course. Um, so, Lorca, tell you most important thing for us. So, Katarzyna is going to be talking to us about sociological understanding of beauty. Um, so, uh, thank you for introducing me and I'm very happy uh, to be here and what I've realized uh, since yesterday, they, that we, you as a speaker touched many things I would like to speak today. So, you know, immediately I have many associations. So, maybe I will not stick, uh, which is not usual with me, stick to the presentation, but also we react what you've already said. And so now um, with my presentation, I will deal with a specific topic and specific context of uh, Russian Orthodox milieu of uh, 20th century. And the people who are called sometimes very poetically lovers of holy wisdom. Okay, lovers, I love it. Um, uh, lovers of holy wisdom. Those who uh, of course, were under the intellectual heritage of Dostoevsky and this sentence which we repeat since yesterday already several times, the beauty that saves the world. And under this influence through Vladimir Solovyov, uh, let's call him a Russian religious philosopher, one of the most significant person, they somehow incorporated wisdom and seeing wisdom as also beauty into their theology, orthodox theology. This is very interesting if you look at Vladimir Solovyov and his visions of holy wisdom. Solovyov describes this vision as seeing female divine beauty, okay, female divine beauty. And together with it, this female divine beauty, it was the, also the feeling of unity unity of all, so female divine beauty and also experiencing the unity, the lost paradise, okay, again we are here, pan unity, he says. And those Russian Orthodox theologian, namely Vladimir, um, Vlad, uh, sorry, uh, Pavel Florensky, Sergei Bulgakov, close friends and Orthodox priests, they incorporated holy wisdom into their theological perspective. I will touch them and I will also touch the work of my favorite long loved Orthodox nun, Mother Maria Skopcova, one of those lovers of holy wisdom also. And I'm speaking from a very specific context because both Sergei Bulgakov and Mother Maria Skopcova, they were refugees, those who left Russia after revolution and specific situation of Pavel Florensky who died in Gulag, okay? So this is very specific uh, milieu uh, of interpretation of holy wisdom and also the beauty. I will try to answer, I am not sure if I will manage everything, to answer the questions which you see uh, here. So for Bulgakov, Florensk and Mother Maria, what kind of beauty is it that saves the world in their theological and spiritual experience? How does wisdom, Sophia, manifest itself in this concept, or herself better. 
And where can we find this saving beauty? Where? And finally, how to distinguish between beauty and ugliness? Again, there is this romantic division between beauty and ugliness. So what is Sophianic beauty? Uh, this is a question very difficult, okay? Uh, because sociology as such is very complex, you know, um, uh, all those figures of sociology, they work with many, many uh, numerous sources from patristic to Jakob Behme and uh, German uh, idealism, and it's described in many ways. And here I were answering, sorry, uh, Timothy's question yesterday. All of them, they didn't, how to say, they didn't reflect meeting with holy wisdom and beauty only in theological critical reflection, but in poetic writing, in poems, you know, in their drawings. And then in philosophy, religious philosophy or theology. So it's very complex because meeting with Sophia is not only critical uh, theological work, but also experiencing with something which is beyond me, even the visionary um, uh, seeing which we cannot describe in words, okay? So we have everything in work of those people, so it's very difficult to define holy wisdom and what is beautiful, because sometimes it's not just kept in definition, in concepts, and this is very, uh, this is very crucial. And then we speak also not about wisdom, but also about beauty. But what is the most significant theoretical presupposition? And I'm coming back to Geza. It's the, the figure of holy wisdom from the Old Testament, especially the wisdom literature and the Proverb 8, you know, where wisdom was with God at the creation. This is very crucial. She, if I can call, personified, she was there. Okay, so she was at the very act of creation. So in all sociological concepts, Sophia is there. She is the bridge between heaven and earth, created, uncreated, uh, uh, ideal and you know, real. So it's the bridge. Uh, and so she is described as the original beauty of creation. This lost paradise, okay? Original beauty of the creation. And this is very crucial because then this tendency, this bridge, you know, also enters in all those attempts of sophiologists or lovers of holy wisdom to overcome, even in the beauty, to overcome dualism of body-mind, uh, dualism of uncreated and created, divine and profane, and so on. So Sophia is element that unites, then reconciles the binarities. And it's also in the sociological understanding of beauty, where material, corporal, is rehabilitated. It's very important. And I will show you on some quotations, for example, by Pavel Florensky. So Sophia, Sophianic beauty is the beauty, the original beauty of creation, and it's never nothing external as some cover. Uh, even if they use word spiritual, it doesn't stand in opposition to natural world or the physical beauty, okay? It, beauty penetrates uh, in wisdom all, all layers of reality. It shines through corporal, through physical. And so this is very important even if they uh, describe it as experience with light, you know, we, we spoke about it, with light, beauty is shining. Beauty was at the beginning or uh, transparent, so things were visible, so you could see, uh, you could see. So light is something how they, the, how, uh, they describe meeting with beauty, shining, okay? So, uh, they either describe it as an encounter with light or in, from the discourse or terms mystical tradition of Orthodox Church as uncreated light. So something which has saving power here. You know. um, I would like to now um, 
uh, here, uh, if, you, if you can see, this is the picture of also one of the lovers of holy wisdom, a uh, spiritual daughter of Father Sergei Bulgakov, Sister Yana Reitlinger. Why I like this picture very much? Because it's our icon. This is the story of Adam and Eve. But if you look at it, there is everything. Even the expelling from, you know, Eden, from the paradise, as we heard from Gaza. And I, I like it because you see that the wisdom as original beauty, which was at the creation, is still here, even after the human and uh, angelic fall, okay? It's not fully present but it's here. So according to those lovers of holy wisdom, okay, there is in the world, in the created foundation, which is divine, okay? So we can glimpse the original beauty, glimpse, maybe not fully, but we can see uh, Sophia as original beauty in many ways, as Geza also described. The first way where we can see the beauty, as I spoke about it, is the creation. That's why many times they speak about creation and uh, Sophia as beauty as part of cosmological concept. Uh, what I would like to now concentrate on, that within the uh, creation, all of them, literally all of them, speak about the beauty in nature. Okay, we've heard also again. Nature, it's something which fills us, you know, nourishes us walking in the nature, being in the nature, and um, experience it. And uh, it's something very comforting, very comforting. And it nor the beauty of nature, if it is beautiful, it nourishes us, whoever we are, who, whatever we believe in. Okay. And it's simply accessible to all. For Florensky and Bulgakov, this beauty is the touch of Holy Spirit that inherits in it. Uh, so again, I don't want to now analyze the, how to say it, uh, the connection between wisdom and Holy Spirit, okay? Because it's very difficult and each author, it's a little bit different. But it's very interesting to quote here uh, Bulgakov. Uh, who says that uh, in the nature, there is natural grace, okay? Nature is naturally spiritual. And so that's why everyone can meet beauty in the nature, can be somehow nourished and wealth in the nature. Uh, and uh, and this, is, this is something what we can uh, really experience. However, and this is very interesting, I'm sorry for the other picture. This is this idealized picture of you know, humans uh, living in harmony, which was Edenic sometimes experienced also now, which is beautiful. You know, Saint Seraphim was Sarov, you know, speaking with bear, you know, being in the forest, which is nice. But what Bulgakov says, and it's very important, we also observe ugliness in the nature, you know? And not in the sense that I don't like insects, okay? Or I don't like, uh, well, sometimes <laughs> it's uh, better to kill them, sorry. Uh, or uh, spiders and so, it's so, not in kinds, you know, that I wouldn't like. All kinds of animals, of plants are beautiful. But Bulgakov describes this ugliness in a very similar way as Théard de Chardin yesterday. Struggle between being and non-being. Fighting for life and falling back into chaos. Okay. So this is very important. Chardin has something similar, you know, like gaining being again and losing being. So we can see, unfortunately, that everything in nature is dying, you know, and one animal eats another, and I'm sorry for this picture. Uh, this is from three year movie Antichri Antichrist or Antichrist, you know. So this is ugly. This is when what we can see in the nature, this is the death, you know, small ones uh, carrying there. And it's, it's, it's ugly. And Bulgakov calls this ugliness 
the dark side of Sophia, a demonic Ahamor that we know from Gnosis. Okay? So he uses this paradox again, the dark side of holy wisdom, which is a little bit mystic. He doesn't go farther really, but he notices also this. And now he calls again into his theological interpretation us people, okay? So he says, nature in, its, in itself is prehuman. Uh, it has no freedom, but we as people who are bearing spirit also, uh, who are microcosmos, I will come back to it, we are able to decide, you know, what is good and what is bad. And we are also able to either appreciate natural beauty, you know, admire it, cultivate it, but also destroy it. Okay, so uh, there is a potential for ecology and so on in this nice contribution to taking care and to properly see natural beauty and it's upon our vision of it, our attitude to the, towards natural beauty. A beautiful person, <laughs> of course, beautiful person, who is beautiful, okay? Uh, it's very difficult to say sometimes. Uh, from the sociological point of view, a human being is part of nature, but it's not everything what we can say about people. Following the patric patristic tradition, the lovers of holy wisdom say that the human being is the crossroads of the natural and divine worlds, a microcosm. Okay? Uh, but they really try to emphasize both. So uh, God's image in people doesn't touch only part of us. And this, these are the quotations from Sergei Bulgakov. The human bodies are the art of the divine artist, the wisdom of God. And another quotation from Bulgakov, man is one and whole. He is not dismembered into parts, into body and soul, but is incarnate spirit or spirit bearing flesh. Okay? So if they speak about the beauty, they, how to say, they don't speak um, about ugliness of physical bodies, you know. And uh, they appreciate physical be beauty uh, as such. Yeah. And even if, there is a beautiful picture by Mother Maria Skopcova from uh, illustrating Job, you know, sitting there naked in his embodied existence. Uh, even if Pavel Florensky, he was the one who really much emphasized the beauty as ascetic, you know, describing his experience with his spiritual father, uh, Father Isidore, like one who is uh, very spiritual, living in harmony, like in uh, lost paradise, living in harmony with himself, with other people, with the whole creation. But at the same time, he really loved his wife. <laughs> so we, you see uh, Pavel Florensky with his wife, uh, probably 1911, and this beautiful um, quotation, which I would like to read, in the eyes of the most ascetic of the ascetic writers, this incorruptibility is not therefore any castration of the ascetic, <clears throat> not an ataraxy and not indifferent, but a greater responsiveness to the beauty of the flesh. Yeah. Even the ability to be moved to tears, to cry with delight at the sight of a beautiful female body. Okay. <laughs> so one who really like was inheritance of ascetic traditions, spiritual ascetic traditions. Thus the goal of the ascetic striving is to perceive all of creation in its original triumph, triumphant beauty, okay? So you see, you contemplate it, even in beautiful female body, okay? And uh, so great responsiveness, great responsiveness. So for Florensky, asceticism is not castration, not giving up material, physical things, the denial of natural beauty. No, it's, quote, another quote, is to be resurrected before the universal resurrection. 
is to be resurrected before universal resurrection. So again, to see something from the lost paradise, you know, this original beauty. And I am not speaking about the kingdom to come, but this is, of course, the beginning at the end uh, is connected here. And, but the beauty in, her in their description is not about our constitution, but the beauty is about how we live, how we contemplate, how we see beauty and create beauty. So beauty is not only external cover of things, but also it's not external in our perception of beauty. We live beauty and sometimes we don't even notice that we live beauty because someone else come and say, oh, it's so beautiful to see, see you together with someone because they, they experience from side that there is something beautiful happening. For example, Tim and Ivana now. <laughs> uh, Yes, and of course, it's uh, again, there is in their foundation, it's wisdom. Bulgakov says uh, uh, that wisdom, holy wisdom, is usia of Trinity. It's love, okay? So there is the source within the Trinity, which is love. And the source is for us, for our loving relationship to be fulfilled. It's also gift at the same time. But it's within the God, okay? It's within the God. It's Uzia of God. So again, all of them, they emphasize relationship. To live in relationship, it can be beautiful if the relationship are fulfilled. And again, the physical love, the sexuality is not crossed out. No, if it, lives, uh, if it leads to bigger love, mutual understanding, again. So if they speak about not beautiful relationship, they speak about pathological form of love, which can be also very much spiritual. Or, so in both sides, there is idolatry or pathological forms, you know, either pornography or, uh, I don't know, crossing castration would be a very good example of it. So living, living beauty, okay? And not only living, but also to see how many times since yesterday we mentioned seeing beauty. But thanks to Yiri, I will now um, <laughs> correspond to, to you. They see the beauty for them to, is to contemplate. It sometimes requires time. It's not to run from where I stand to see something beautiful. It's just here to contemplate. As Father Sergei Bulgakov say, in a little bit German idealistic expression, to see the real idea of things or to see the name, okay, hieroglyph, <laughs> to at least glimpse, glimpse this beauty. To understand, it is to contemplate. And so the contemplation of beauty, it takes time. It happens where we are. It's just, it's not, the distance between object and object, but it's seeing it uh, in inner meaning. Bulgakov speaks about noetic seeing, okay? And noetic seeing, it means also that you don't just see beauty, but you get known the other person or animal. So it's epistemological part also involved. You see, you get known. It's English, no, I see. It means also that I don't only see, but I understand, if I understand it correctly. <laughs> I think, yes. <laughs> uh, and so live beauty, see as contemplate, as noetic beauty, as, as noetic seeing, and also to create. And this is something which uh, those lovers of holy wisdom, especially in exile, they again uh, um, rehabilitated uh, participation of human being in salvation as co-creation. Creativity came back into theological discourse. So we are able to create beauty or as they say, co-create better because there are always two parts, divine and human. Okay, And, uh, but most of them, when they speak about beauty, especially Father Sergei Bulgakov, they speak about the visual arts, about the fine arts because of the 
uh, orthodox contexts and iconography, okay? So if they describe the beauty, it's most of the time within uh, the uh, visual art, within the fine arts. Uh, yes, uh, I will maybe uh, come back to it uh, during the discussion. Uh, what I also want to emphasize at the end is this is something very important. And Ivana touched that yesterday. This is the aesthetic versus beauty or aestheticism <laughs> versus beauty. And I can speak now about their attitude to our aestheticism without beauty and wisdom or aesthetics. They don't really differ it because they, if they speak about aestheticism or aesthetics, it's more critical because it's more about form, you know, about formalism. So really the topic is beauty and then the ugliness. If they use the word aestheticism is more critical. Uh, as I said, people play an irreplaceable role in interpreting and defining what is and is not beautiful, okay? And so people are able, those who are either to be attracted by physical beauty, to be seduced, to be able to see other layers, their spiritual beauty that shines through. Within the Orthodox tradition, the process pertains to the goal of human life, which is deification, regaining the lost unity, which we saw at the beginning. And Florensky, Pavel Florensky writes, to pull your life towards God means to be pulled to beauty itself. By setting an order in place, first searching for God and only then comes beauty. I don't think that they are so divided. But what Florensky wants to highlight is the danger of concentrating the search on beauty itself, okay? which can be misleading in many ways. First, it can lead to seeing beauty as something completely and merely external. Here, among partners, uh, uh, sorry, no, correct, merely, uh, merely uh, external rather than being a mediator towards holiness, towards this unity with God. Beauty itself become God. In theological terms, in their theological terms, beauty stops being iconic and becomes idolic. For this reason, Bulgakov defines art as more than a mere copying of reality or making it complete or even worse, creating a new being. Art rather is the ability to see the real idea and things and true names again. And again, what is important in the perception and appreciation of beauty, we stand here in the antinomy that we must hold on if we want to, to um, comprehend beauty. To avoid two opposite dangers, idolizing and consuming beauty, and or idolizing the bodiless meta-natural ideal, you know, which in practice can lead to self-mortification, mortification of others and veneration of ugliness. <laughs> this is what I'm afraid of also, you know. If it is ugly, it's saint, it's pious. No, it's not true. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes. And now uh, I would like to conclude uh, my speech um, again by Mother Maria Skopcova. Her picture is here, her photo. When she was in Paris in exile, and of course she needed to help uh, uh, Ru Russian refugees at the time, and also she helped many uh, Jewish uh, during the Second World War. And she had to again reinterpret uh, spiritual life. And when she speaks, within or towards the context or orthodox spiritual life, she is afraid of aesthetic or too much concentration on aesthetic spiritual way. Why? Because she sees in this appreciation only of the aesthetic part of spiritual life, uh, she says, uh, spiritual archeology. span <laughs> That 
we are too much in Byzantine, okay? Okay, this is the truth beauty. And what else, what, she, uh, what goes in hand, uh, hand in hand with it, that we are creating some <coughs> elite group, you know? These, we are those who understand what is beautiful, okay? And it's there, it's in the past. Archaeological spirituality. And she was there in Paris helping those needed. She didn't have basically time for it. And she understood that there are no Byzantine icons. Okay, right. So what? Where is the beauty? So I'm finishing or concluding with a little bit your ideas also there. So uh, we cannot keep only the spiritual archaeology because it creates elite group and finally we don't recognize what is truly beautiful. So from her perspective, she goes farther. She says, seeing beauty in the ugliness of the world, in the deprivation of sinners, in the lives of drunk, uh, drunkards, turning side upside down. Because she wants to disturb this piety, which is false, which is Hippocratic. Okay? And uh, yes. So I think I can conclude uh, coming back to this idea of also Solovyov's convention that there is always triune uh, reality, which is not only beauty, but also truth and goodness. So for her, it was also how we behave towards others. That's beautiful because it's uh, beauty embodied, incorporated. And so keep them together. And also what keeps together is important, not just archaeology, you know, <laughs> spiritual archaeology, but also the prophetic spirituality. So both together, you know. And um, I'm here, here are the, this is the photo of, this is Mother Maria's uh, icon uh, of angel there, you know. And it was uh, in the churches, maybe still will be, Seraphim of Sarov, you know, we visited many times with Ivana. But in April there was a huge fire and nearly all icons were destroyed, apart from this angel, you know, and some others. But I want just to speak about it as an example. This was, I, I read discussion on Facebook about this, you know, and someone just said, this is something what would Mother Maria appreciate, you know. I mean, this is, you know, we don't have to keep it. We don't have to keep what she made as an icon. But for me, it's a little bit tricky. On one side, this is something she f um, fought for, you know, to see beauty when it is necessary. We don't have to keep this heritage from the past. But on the other side, I think we should also take care of the heritage, beautiful heritage of the past. So it's a question for you, <laughs> what you think, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Katarzyna. Um, so now we have about 20 minutes for questions, uh, comments, etc. Uh, and I think probably, is that microphone working now? Or? Yeah, okay, so I will leave this microphone here and um, I can take the other microphone around. So any questions or comments or? Thank you very much for those uh, two brilliant papers. I have a small uh, point to discuss with you, Geza, about separating the first part, which is basically about paradise and ref the way back to lost paradise, and the second part, which is about the kingdom, and that, uh, therefore be more political. Uh, because the artist colonies that you mentioned, I would add, to them, um, uh, the transcendentalist uh, colony, Brook Farm, where people strived to create beauty, uh, to meditate, and they also had a strict 
uh, vegetarian and communitarian ideals. So often an artist colony has these utopian streaks. So in fact, there might be a softer tr or a more interesting transition between the two parts. Then about uh, Mother Mary, she, I think, belongs to the wall of martyrs like Bonhoeffer, like Romero, because she was deported, because she had this cottage industry of fabricating false uh, passports for Jewish uh, people, whom she helped in that way. And I was teaching with my closest Orthodox a colleague at Cato, who is the priest of the church in the in the Quinzième, uh, uh, Saint Seraphin, so which was burned. And he said it took 15 minutes, no more. Within 15 minutes, the church had disappeared. And I believe that it was an act of a misguided person who wanted to protest against the war by Russia in Ukraine. Because I've noticed that the other Russian Orthodox Church in Paris, which is Putin's church, uh, is heavily guarded by police cars day and night. But uh, Father Chenokrak's church and Mary's Kapschula skirt is a very modest church in a fairly modest neighborhood, as you know who have seen it. And they can't afford police. Uh, so there again, it's, it's, I feel terrible sadness to think of the loss of that chapel, which is built around a tree, which is also unique, and, uh, and, and her beautiful work. Thank you. I didn't mean to separate at all paradise and because that became very clear to me that really they are both, you know, we see beauty in both. It just that I kind of started out to think about, okay, get some examples for paradise and get some examples for the kingdom of God. And that's how I just structured the talk in order to say in the end, really, it is both. Just, uh, I don't know, I can react just to the sad story. And we were both really very sad with Ivana. And she painted also this beautiful drawing of this church and the, around the tree. And it's on the cover of our book. And But for me, I, I ask you this question because it's really very important for me, you know, because uh, this Facebook discussion about, you know, this is something what Mother Maria w wouldn't be worried about that her icon just or her icons were at the top in the fire but at the same time so i spoke with a friend of my orthodox and she told me bella we orthodox are not able to keep our heritage you know in a good uh, you know good state you know we are not so it's very broad question you know uh, which is connected also our perception of theological of the past and present and the future and it's connected to our spiritual way and uh, yeah and our vision where we where our eyes are concentrated either in past present or future or the whole linear time yeah thank you Thank you very much for both uh, lectures. I have actually two questions. Uh, um, one concerning the first presentation. Thank you very much for for your lecture. Um, I was kind of um, um, asking myself as I was listening um, uh, a similar question to the one which was already raised. Um, because it uh, sounded a little like, you know, you know, human history moving from the paradise to the kingdom and the nostalgia for paradise lost is something that perhaps might be transformed into the hopeful expectation of the coming kingdom in the future but at the same time i think in the biblical tra tradition there is a very strong motive of the future being somehow the paradise restored or regained or 
somehow the new Jerusalem being the old Jerusalem transformed or the new creation being the old creation resurrected and restored. And I think there is some insight in that parallelism, in that correspondence between the lost paradise and the paradise regained. And so, so I was kind of missing that bit um, because it seemed like, yeah, paradise lost, associated primarily with natural beauty and the coming kingdom associated primarily with social justice as if there be some kind of shift or difference or, of emphasis. And I understand you didn't mean that, but I, I, I just kind of missed that um, idea of the promised future being in some sense paradise again, even terminologically, that's Gan Eden again, um, the, the one we still expect. And that's my first comment. And the, the, the second related to uh, Katarzyna's presentation. Thank you also very much. Uh, and uh, was so stimulating and inspiring. At the same time, I was just thinking some of the biblical references and some of the, some of the, the concepts you associated with Sophia and, you, um, and, and the authors you are working with associate with Sophia have been associ associated with the second person of the Trinity in the uh, Christian tradition very often, even Proverbs 8 and John 1. And perhaps some of that might also be put under the Christological uh, category. And, and you did actually explicitly refer to, to the possible pneumatological um, connection, the third person of the Trinity. But still, it, it, for, for an ignorant person like myself, it, it, it might sound as if Sophia is still something else than the second or the third person of the Trinity. So please um, <laughs> clarify that for me. <laughs> you could be here a very long time. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's partly the same answer as I, I, I gave before. It's also, I think, has to do with the way the question was put, the, the theme was put. Maybe that I kind of started concentrating on the, and then this, and trying to kind of, you know, get the movement towards the kingdom. But you're absolutely right. And I don't know whether this is going to end up in articles or something, but that's something that, you know, I certainly would uh, would emphasize at the end as well, sort of what, what you just said, you know, that New Jerusalem and all of this. In fact, I was thinking about that when I, when I was writing, I said, no, no, I just think of, of something else now, write about other things. But yeah, uh, so yeah, I agree with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, he and then Ivana have questions, but we really might be here f for, for quite a long time, you know? And when Father Bulgakov, it's very complex. And if Father Bulgakov goes back to the patristic literature, he spe speak about so-called log logological sophiology, you know. So, which is what Greek uh, have. I mean, this is when you, when I'm in Cyprus and I go to the village and there is the icon of uh, Pantocrator and it's written Hagia Sophia. Uh, so, crisis wisdom. So, it's logological sophiology. But in the Russian context, it's more, and I haven't mentioned it. It's not just dealing with uh, Holy Spirit. I will come back to it. But it's also very much Mariological. So I haven't noted, I haven't spoken about it. It would be for a long time. But uh, Maria, God's mother, is the one, you know, like this deified person, person beautiful, uh, sign of the original creation of of a man, sorry, of a woman, woman already being deified. So it's more mariological, and it's appeared not only in iconography, in s churches and so on. So it's like this. And uh, yeah, and um, this is the whole discussion whether Sophia is the fourth one or not. You know, that's why Father Sergei Bulgakov got into trouble because of it. But if I can answer you know, only in a simple way, 
I intentionally started with the cosmological presupposition because I think it was his main and also Florensky main uh, desire theological to find the connection between two between dualistic approach or monistic approach to uh, the world which they lived in. And it was fair enough. And also I think Father Sergei Bulgakov speak about Sophia as net, not as about the fourth hypostasis, but someone, she is an hypostized in three person, okay? So even the Holy Spirit. So sometimes Bulgakov says that Sophia is actualized by Holy Spirit, okay, by Pneuma. But in every person of Trinity, the role of Sophia is a little bit different. It's manifested in a different way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Katarzyna. Um, so Pavel and then I think Ivana. Thank you very much, both Giza and Katka, for your stimulating and rich papers. I have a question about chaos. I, w <laughs> I was intrigued by, by uh, Katarina's um, emphasis, or uh, which I found very helpful on, on ugliness as a struggle between being and non-being, between striving for life and kind of trying not to fall into, into chaos. And I'm wondering what the role of chaos actually might be in the whole process of what Pavel described as transformation from old Jerusalem to new Jerusalem. I mean, when you look at uh, cycles in the nature, for example, decay and the new growth, s some artists uh, explicitly refer to chaos as an important stage in their arts that first you go have to go to some kind of primordial chaos to give rise to something new. And then, for example, in the biblical account of creation, tohu wa bohu as well. So is there any place for chaos and can chaos be beautiful? Uh, when I mentioned this uh, dark side of Sophia, uh, for me it's very it's very open, uh, and I wanted to think about it more and to understand it more. But it's very interesting because Bulgakov mentioned it only little, you know. So it's also it was his struggle, <laughs> and uh, he didn't have too much time to think, or maybe he did want to to think about it more and. Uh, to see ugliness as chaos, I understand it, because chaos is sometimes very disturbing and you just don't want it, you know? This is not the paradise or kingdom to come. And, but of course, if you take time as cyclic, you know, uh, you have to die to be reborn, also the metaphoric language of New Testament, you know, to, to, to be born again. Yes, uh, probably, uh, yes, even the physical uh, death is kind of one step into, let's say, eternal, another life, like transforma transformative. Uh, yeah. Uh, but maybe when he used the chaos and this, it's, it's non-being, I think it's nothing. It's not being even like bad being, it's just nothing. So maybe to feel chaos as non-existence would be kind of explanation. You are not. You are not even that. <laughs> do, do you have a Okay, um, thanks. Um, I, I'm just thinking um, on, on that. Um, you know, if you read the books, books on chaos theory, and the pictures they have are the fractal, fractal pictures of in books. On, I mean, they're very beautiful. So, I mean, I'd say chaos is incredibly beautiful. <laughs> but um, anyway, but not a good way to run a conference always. Ivana. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the beautiful lectures, which I have enjoyed very much. Uh, I was touched, Geza, uh, by your speaking about the power of beauty to cross the boundaries. And what I really liked in your presentation was how you tried to document how these boundaries can be crossed. And uh, I think yesterday I tried to speak also about the crisis of uh, losing some of the concepts, some of the dead symbols, which I think touch quite deeply into Christianity. 
When I accompany retreats, for example, or when people come for a spiritual direction, and sometimes people from Christian churches, Catholics, Protestants, some Orthodox, some people from evangelical churches, uh, where they would be uh, fed on the story of Christ, story of redemption. And when it comes to breaking of the bread, it doesn't mean anything to them. Because uh, these mysteries were killed by the concepts. And I think what I liked in your, <coughs> both of your presentations was the attempt to seek how the movement from the lost to the new that we don't have yet, how this movement can be found, revitalized, what we used to call redemption, but the language doesn't work any longer for many people. And so it feels that in today's situation, speaking about creation and speaking about the spirit is actually much, much easier than speaking about Christ and the work of Christ or even practically about the transition. Yes, people pray to Christ, they are ill, or their friends are ill, and their friends die, and sometimes it's the end of it. The transition doesn't happen. People pray for peace, and the peace is not here yet, and that's the end of it. Uh, it's not the complete end, but it's end for a long time for the people. So maybe if you would comment a little bit on the beautiful in the transition and how do you think that the transition which used to be called redemption or salvation can be rediscovered? <coughs> well, <coughs> it's a big subject, but um, I think, you know, it's even kind of visible in, in theology itself, how it's become <coughs> so... Um, I suppose divided into into many subforms. So, for example, my my work has been on theology and the visual art, and you know I did my doctorate on ten Irish artists, <laughs> and my choice was to um, to use artists who are not kind of churchgoers, who are not kind of you know not church artists making commissions for the church, but who um, from their own desire kind of engaged with the theme of, say, of Christ, or who might just have a wider spirituality in their work. So that's kind of, you know, there's something of the transition there. It's still there, faith is still there, but, you know, we find it just in, in tiny glimpses, more, more, far, far more than, than stated, you know. Um, so that was, and I think, you know, theology is doing this more and more, especially in its connection with the arts. In other words, reaching into areas where where it has become very difficult to speak about Christ and redemption and resurrection because most people don't know about it. And people are no, no longer socialized in that way. Margot Kesemann, a German bishop, told us once when she was in Dublin that she was asked by a little boy, what is, what, what is that um, plus sign doing on the top of that building? And, you know, it's kind of so shocking you're no longer dealing with people who are anti-religion, but who really kind of do not, nothing about religion at all. It's, it's, so from, from that point of view, theology needs to, to as people who, to, yeah, who, do, who have lost that language, but are still searching. Thank you. <laughs> I think that I would like to continue what Geza said. It's only in glimpse. The transition happens in small things sometimes, you know, and meetings. I didn't uh, put the slide here, but I love this picture. I have it in my room. I mean, two friends, Florensky, Bulgakov walking, and this is a heavenly discussion. They are in the nature. They are close friends, soulmates, they are discussing. And this is something beautiful. This is the quote from Florensky. And if you, I can even now in this very difficult situation, thanks to Andre yesterday for our conversation, it was relieving, it was reconciliating for me. Thank you very much. So in those tiny moments, <laughs> you glimpse this beauty. And um, 
Uh, so you can read this uh, beautiful, um, uh, beautiful uh, sentence by Florensky about their friendship, uh, Bulgakov. And I have also here, which I didn't comment, you know, <laughs> this is a new icon kind of, you know, from one very young Orthodox artist who loves street, uh, street art, you know. <laughs> so you see piety, piety, but not uh, where is love, you know. So this is Mother Maria Skopcova in this very, uh, very inspiring, very new creative way of iconography, okay. Street work and iconography, okay. So I think that Mother Maria would love this, <laughs> okay. So that's probably all I can say. Okay. <laughs> but she would need glasses for it. <laughs> okay, thank you very, very much indeed, Geza and Katarzyna. Thank you very much.